All right. My mouth is kind of dry today. It might have been that fall that I took uh, in, in Peru. Yeah, you'll get a kick out of that video. I'll show it to you. Uh, how, how do you have that video, Pastor? They have security cameras in the place we were ministering. And they actually, after I took the fall, it was so bad that everybody in the room went, oh! and like, is he going to get up? And, I, you know, I just learned, like, when I played sports in school, no matter how hard you get hit, get back up. Don't let anybody see. So as I get up, I try to run, and you can see me kind of, like, limping away from it. I told Jonathan Murley I was headed to the light for a minute. Um, and and uh, so they went back, and they looked on the security cameras, and they found it for me in all of my glory falling. So I'll show you uh, next week. Um, how coordinated I am. Okay, uh, final message on Revelation, and I hope that you have enjoyed it. I I'd like to take a moment and just thank Kate uh, Matat for teaching last week. I thought she did an excellent job with the message. Uh, here's what it does to have a good teaching team around me. It allows me the opportunity for the break. It allows me the opportunity to be able to go and do the things that I'm asking you to do, like being able to go and step into a place of outside of my status quo and my comfort zone of going into all the world and, and making disciples and preaching the gospel and reaching out to people. And, and it, it so humbles me, it so fills my heart, but it's only possible because I have people and a support network around me that, that allow me that opportunity. Uh, so I just wanted to say thank you for that. I realize also when I say this, listen, if you are like five weeks for the entire book of Revelation, yes. Um, I, I, I never intended uh, and said it from the beginning that we were going to go chapter by chapter and verse by verse. I never felt the Lord tell me to do that. Revelation is one of those books where you very much, you, you could get lost in the middle of it trying to do it that way. I'm not saying that it's not a good way to do it, but you could do that. And I didn't feel like the Lord said that's the way to do it. So we've spent five weeks on this series. At some point, I'll come back and teach some more on it, but we felt like it was enough for right now. We'll move into a new series that I'll begin uh, next weekend, but we're going to end Revelation this weekend with the last chapter, which is chapter 22 of Revelation. Now, I've said this in fun and in jest, but in all seriousness, if what I've taught through this series and what you heard Kate teach, uh, when we're talking about prophetic events that are going to come to the earth, uh, some of them are like, wow, they're mind-blowing. Some of them are a little, they're a little scary, to be honest. Uh, some of them speak of pressure that's going to be put on believers. And so, um, you know, uh, when, when we talk about those things, of course, they, they can be very exciting. Our imagination can be ignited. But you, at the same time, you know, the enemy loves to take things that aren't exactly, we're not clear on how that's going to play out in my life. And the enemy loves to come and try to bring some kind of fear into things. And so let, let me just tell you right now that if you're fearful about any of these things, that's not God. God doesn't want you to be fearful of these things. That's not why he, he gives us the insight to it. It's just the opposite. He wants his people to know that when these things happen, we don't go, what in the world is going on? We should be the light in darkness saying, we know exactly what's going on. And here's the way, walk in it. And so uh, what we're going to do in uh, chapter 22 is finish up with the idea that when it's all said and done, if you have any fear, any worry, this is always the way to, to think about it. Go to the very last uh, stanza of all the events, uh, read the last chapter, and you can kind of cheat on the story, we win. Okay, <laughs> Through it all, no matter what happens, no matter what event comes to the earth, I can tell you what the outcome is going to be. Jesus is going to be king, and you are going to rule and reign with him forever. And that's what the Bible says. So I'll show you that today. So we're going to go to Revelation 22. Uh, I'll use as the main text 1 through 6, so you can follow along uh, as I read it. Uh, then the angel showed me. Me is John, uh, the same John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, that John. He also wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and the book of Revelation. So those four books... This disciple who walked with Jesus, the one who said of himself, the one that Jesus loved. Okay, that guy is the one writing this right now. He writes this as an old man. He's advanced. Uh, he was the oldest living disciple. Uh, was not, um, uh, I was going to say persecuted. He was persecuted, but he did not die at the hands of his persecutors. He actually lived through 
the persecuted and died as an old man. But when he writes this, uh, most scholars believe he's in his 80s at this point. He's an older man. So then the angel showed me, John, a river with the water of life. So remember that term right there, water of life and river. Uh, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So it puts, just real quickly, I want you to see this theologically, it describes the throne, but it doesn't describe two thrones. It describes a single throne, and that throne is called God's throne and Jesus' throne. And here's the thought. God and Jesus aren't two separate gods. They're the same one. But they exist in two separate uh, entities, for lack of a better word, in that God came to earth as a man. He gave up heaven in order to come to earth as a man because the Bible says through one man sin entered the earth, that was Adam, and by one man redemption, that's Jesus. So it couldn't be God uh, in, in the form of God who came to earth to fix what a man did. A man had to come and do it. And it, it's sort of a, a, a mystery. And I just, I, yeah, I'm not going there right now. All right. So flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, so it just describes and puts on the same level that Jesus and God are the same, and it flowed down the center of the main street. Where's the street at? It's, it's in heaven on each side of the river. Now, so notice this because we're going to look at two other scriptures in different parts of the Bible that give a same uh, portrait, uh, prophecy, and picture of what it's going to be like in that day and at that time. So on each side of the river grew a tree of life, uh, bearing 12 crops of fruit with a fresh crop each month. So like in our natural world, crops basically will come once a year. You plant them, they grow, uh, produce the fruit, harvest, and then you start all over again. What we have here are supernatural uh, things going on where this tree is bearing constantly. It never wears out and it has enough for everybody. So a fresh crop each month. And then it says the leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. Real quick, what, is that, what does that mean? What is that talking about? All right, uh, the, the nations, the earth, the people that live in the earth. Folks, um, the original intention of God with creation is that he created the perfect environment, uh, everything working in unison the way it's supposed to work, uh, man and his environment, the environment with man, nature, it all uh, it cooperated together and it worked perfectly. And man, when he went his own way, when he did the one thing that God said you can't do, uh, of all the trees in the garden you're free to eat, except of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because if you eat of that tree, it'll kill you. And I heard a guy say on the radio, you see, that's the proof that God's trying to keep people from knowledge. That, that is exactly how the devil works, is to misquote a book they never read in the first place. He never says, I'm trying to keep you from knowledge. He said, I'm trying to keep you from evil. And I'm try God is always and forever trying to keep people from choosing death. And I don't know what it is about us, but when we're left to our own devices, when we're not walking, being filled with the Holy Spirit and walking with God, we choose death. And so you hear that and you say, I would never choose death. I'm not talking about like a skull and crossbones. That's not what I'm talking about. Jesus makes it simple when he says things like this. If you hold bitterness in your heart, it will kill you. We have that simple instruction and we can't forgive people. We are, we are more readily willing to hold on to stuff and offense than we are to let it go. True or not? So, so when you think of this idea of, of death, uh, uh, Moses, Joshua, I set before you life and death blessing and cursing, and then this admonishment. Therefore, choose. Why would he have to encourage people to choose life? Doesn't that seem like it would be the easy thing to decide? And I would say these two reasons are why. One, the enemy, he, he, he camouflages uh, death to look like life so that when we look at it, we don't see death. We think, uh, man, I don't know, it's an affair. Nobody ever says, I want to do this because I want to kill myself. People do it because they think it's going to be the greatest thing they ever did. Thank you for that big amen. Huge. Woo! 
They never think this is going to kill my spouse. They never think this is going to mess up my finances. They never think I'm going to have to uh, live a life that's not uh, in, in unison. I'm going to, they, they never think I'm going to have to hide things and, 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 and end up in a place I don't want. They, all they see is the fun that's going to be. Yes or no? And that's how it always starts. So, so Joshua, I set before you life, death, blessing, cursing. That should be enough. But then he has to tell them, therefore, choose li like yeah. Yeah. this one in case you're wondering. <laughs> I just, it, it's just, yeah. It, it all, it, it, in my mind, it's all symbiotic in teaching uh, very clearly throughout scripture, this idea. Uh, so <clears throat> I... Preaching without getting through my text. That's awesome. Uh, the leaves were used for medicine to heal the nation. So this idea of healing is that with the fall of man, a curse is on all of creation. And I'll show you here in just a minute. Uh, man, nature, the earth, all that's been created is under a curse because of what man did. And this tells us that the idea of God restoring all of creation back to its original intent, uh, it's going to happen through this healing of the nations. No longer will there be a, what's the word? Upon anything. How much is anything? Everything. Uh, for the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there, and his servants will worship him, and they will see his, what? Remember that. And his name will be written on their foreheads, and there will be no night uh, there, no need for lamps, or for the sun, it doesn't say that there won't be a sun. It just simply says there won't be the need for the sun like we have today. And then it explains why. For the Lord God will shine on them and they will reign forever and ever. So here, here's the, the thought with that. It's God's presence will be so great. You will reflect the glory of God. And therefore, the normal thing that provides light will not be the necessary thing that provides light. Is that Okay. Then the angel said to me, everything you have heard and seen is trustworthy and true. The Lord God who inspires his prophets has sent his angel to tell his servants what will happen soon. So that goes back to the very idea that I said, God is revealing these things to us ahead of time uh, because they're going to happen. And because if he tells us, then we shouldn't freak out like what is happening. If he told us ahead of time, we can have peace in it. Correct. And we can tell other people, Hey, it's all good. God's in charge. All right, so if you have a pen or pencil, you might want to fill in the blanks. If you're using the online version of the notes, perfect. And if you learn best by just listening, that's, that's awesome too. The first one here, uh, the river. So it says in that first verse of Revelations 22, 1, it talks about the river that um, is pointed out coming from the throne of God. What is this river? What's the purpose for this river? Why would John describe a river. Uh, and here, here's a bigger question in my mind, just as uh, a studier of God's word, what is this river and do we find it any place else in the Bible? So I think all through the Bible, the symmetry of the word is there if you'll study it. So from the Old Testament to the New Testament, God's been saying the same thing. But man, when our minds are not renewed, we can even read the Bible messed up. So if we get a renewed mind, we can hear it from God's point of view and see what God's purposes was with it. So what is this river? So verse 1, I'll just read it to you again. Then the angel showed John a river with the water of life. That's an interesting terminology. It's not just a river with water, but the water of life. Everything that God does is to reproduce life. Not, he is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. That's what the Bible says. So all that God does in our life is to reproduce life inside of us. God never calls us to decay. God always calls us to be fruitful. And so this is just more of that talk right there. So the angel showed me a river with the water of life in it, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Let me show you two, uh, two other scriptures real quickly that also use the same wording to describe uh, this river. This is from the Old Testament, a prophet named Ezekiel, who was a powerful prophet of God, one of the major prophets. Ezekiel has a vision also. Interestingly enough, this is over a thousand years before John writes about his vision that he has that we just read in Revelation. This goes all the way back to the Old Testament. So Ezekiel has a vision, and this is what he writes. In my vision, the man, the angel, brought me back to the entrance of the temple. 
There I saw a stream flowing east from beneath the door of the temple and passing to the right of the altar on its south side. How do we know this is the same river? Look, uh, go down to verse 7. When I returned, I was surprised by the sight of many trees growing on both sides of the river. The description is just right there. Then he said to me, this river flows east through the desert into the valley of the Dead Sea. The waters of the stream will make the salty waters of the Dead Sea fresh and pure. And then it begins to describe what it's going to look like. There will be swarms of living things wherever the water of this river flows. So it's living water, and wherever the river goes, everything lives. And it's a really powerful picture that I'll explain here in just a second. Fish will abound in the Dead Sea. All right, real quick. How many people in this room have ever been with me to Israel? Raise your hand real quick. This is an important demonstration. So look around real quick. Maybe 10%, huh? That means that 90% of you need to go with me. That's it. Okay. So um, for those of you who have gone on the trip, you know that on one complete whole day, we go down to the Dead Sea. And you go down because generally we're leaving Jerusalem, which is about 3,500 feet above sea level. And then we head down to the Dead Sea and you end up going to the lowest place on the earth you can go to without going below the water. And if I remember right, check my memory. Don't, if I'm wrong, you do not need to go. What a heretic. I, this is my memory. I'm not sure if I'm, I think it's 1,200 feet below sea level when you go down to the Dead Sea. So the Dead Sea is made up, uh, it's called the Rift Valley that starts in North Africa and runs up uh, through that, uh, that land bridge of Israel and it goes into to Asia. And as the land split in that rift through an earthquake, it formed a, a depression in a low part. So the Sea of Galilee flows down and it goes into the Dead Sea. And because the sea is below, if this is the level of the water, the Dead Sea sits below sea level. And so all the water that flows into it cannot flow back uphill against gravity. Does that make sense? And because of that, listen to this. This pure drinking water from the Sea of Galilee that Jesus walked on flows through Israel, down into this depression, and because the water can't get out, all this goodness is concentrated, but the life ends up corrupting and and decaying, and it turns into a mineral, heavy place where because what flows into it can't get out of it, it ends up becoming a dead place. And it's a picture of our lives this way, that when all we do is receive in, 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 but never let it out, 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 we also become people who decay. Your spirit was made not just to receive, but to give. God calls us to to be a conduit, not just a receptacle, but a conduit so that his spirit can flow into us, bless us, take care of us, but then also flow out to other people. And when you choose only to just take, take, take and never give, you become this receptacle where instead of life flowing through you, it actually turns into a place where decay happens in you. Does that happen? Churches have some of the meanest people that ever walked on the face of the earth. How can that be? How can people that know God become mean? Because there's a formula here. It's not enough to receive. You've got to give too. It's, you've got to be a conduit of God's power flowing in and flowing out. We're not meant just to hear. We're also meant to speak. We're not meant just to grab. We're also meant to release. Does that make any sense? So it's a picture of a reality, but also a truth about us. And the most important thing I want you to see, it's not the idea that, that so, uh, hey, then, then the way to prevent this is to keep God from flowing into me. Absolutely not. What you're supposed to do with this, be open to the Holy Spirit flowing in your life, but be willing to let that thing pass through you too. Be a blessing to other people. Love other people. Pray for other people. Help other people. It got very quiet there all of a sudden. It's like, I was with you till I had to do something. Uh, (laughs) If I live through you, pastor, is that good? No. You've got to do it yourself too. So Ezekiel uh, keeps telling this picture. There will be swarms of living things wherever this water of the river flows. Fish will abound in the Dead Sea. By the way, 
every person that's been with me, there's always an inside joke. The inside joke is somewhere on the trip, usually when we go to the Dead Sea, someone will ask this question, what lives in the Dead Sea? It's a fairly self-answering question. I'm going to give you a chance to get it right. What lives in the Dead Sea? Not much. See, that's the problem. So it's not a 99% issue. <clears throat> Nothing lives. So it, inevitably, I was with a guy one time uh, on the trip. He asked the question three separate times. Yeah, but okay, okay, I get it. Nothing can live there, but what, what lives there? What kind of fish can, is there something at the bottom? Nothing, they call it dead for a reason. It's dead. Nothing lives. Now this picture, this is important because it paints a picture of something that in the natural is absolutely impossible. Fish will abound where? <clears throat> in the Dead Sea. For its waters will become fresh. Life will flourish wherever this river flows to. Let's keep going. Uh, fishermen will stand along the shores of the Dead Sea. All the way from En Gedi, which is where David hid from King Saul, to En Englem, which is all the way down to the south in Israel. The shores will be covered with nets drying in the sun. Fish of every kind will fill the Dead Sea just as they fill the Mediterranean Sea, the freshwater sea. But the marshes and the swamps will not be purified. They will still be salty. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow along both sides of this river. <clears throat> the leaves of those trees, does this not sound like the same description? The leaves of those trees will never turn brown, never fall. There will always be fruit on their branches. Uh, there will be a new crop every month for they are watered by the river flowing from the temple. Uh, the fruit will be for food and the leaves for? Did we just read that same thing in Revelation? So this is just another description of this river, which I believe, just, just so you get this, I think it's a literal thing that happens from God's presence back on the earth again. I think that his presence, it represents the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God will cover the earth in a fantastic way at the return of Jesus, and it will heal and bring life back to everything that's dead. So here's the problem. You've never lived on an earth without a curse. So you have no idea what this earth could, you think it's beautiful now? Good, if it's under a curse, try to imagine, try to imagine what the stars might look like. What animals, what people. So how do we know we're under a curse? So, travel, go from nation to nation and tell me if there's peace. Tell me if there's justice. Tell me if there's a voice for the voiceless. Tell me if people struggle with AIDS. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, we're under a curse. And so then, then the, the ultimate issue with a curse is death. And, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but, but death. So, so that when we experience, and let me just say this, and I, I hear me say it with the very kindest of heart, but the, folks, when we point to something that we caused by going our own way and it brings a curse on the earth, when we experience the curse and then we turn around and point at God and say, why did you do this? We're pointing at the wrong person. We never point at ourselves and say, why did we do that? We always act like it was God's fault that this happened. And that was never God's intention for anything on the earth. All right, let me read this next one real quick. Uh, this comes from Zechariah um, chapter 14, verse 8. And this is another prophet, a minor prophet, but it's a prophetic book yet to be filled. It speaks a lot about Israel, actually. But he also describes this river. And look at his wording. On that day, and that day is the return of Jesus, when his throne is on the earth, when he puts back in order. Isaiah says it this way. When the government rests upon his shoulder. Hey, real quick. Am I just up here preaching myself happy? Are you with me on this? So my wife always tells me, just because people are quiet doesn't mean they're not with you. That's what she, they're thinking. I don't know why that wigs me out. And I really do want you to think, but act like you're enjoying it at the same time. You can think and smile. Like, this, this is like, I never know what to do with that. All right, so on that day, life-giving waters will flow out from Jerusalem. Remember, that's where the temple is. Half towards the Dead Sea, half toward the Mediterranean, flowing continuously in both summer and winter, so it never stops. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Flowing continuously in both summer and winter. My fault, not the people in the back. My fault. My fault. Okay. They, yeah. Okay. So he's describing that same river, 
and what the river does. And if you take all three of those concepts of this river and what this river does, I put this sentence, wherever the river goes, everything lives. And it's a picture, again, of our lives that if there's anything inside of you that's not living, if, if there's anything going on in your life that is decaying, if there's anything happening where it's just, it's death, there's, there's not production, it's not fruitful, that's not what God wants for your life. And what we have here is a promise that wherever the river goes, everything lives. So it's a picture of the Holy Spirit flowing through the earth, flowing through our lives, and whatever is inside of us that is not alive, the Holy Spirit is the cure for death in your life. Amen. And so somehow, regardless of whether you're familiar with the Holy Spirit or unfamiliar with the Holy Spirit, most of us don't know exactly what to do with the Holy Spirit. We get God the Father, we love Jesus the Son, but God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, we're not quite sure what to do with the Holy Spirit. And so for many of us, the Holy Spirit is something more to, to talk about as an it, or a, a, a ghost, or a, an anomaly, but not, the Holy Spirit is what puts flesh on Jesus from history. The Holy Spirit makes him real and alive. The Holy Spirit makes Jesus actually possible in your life today. So rather than reading a historical account of a man who lived 2,000 years ago, what makes Jesus alive in your heart and on the earth today is his spirit that is still here with us. Jesus said, better for you if I go away so that my spirit can be here for all. So the Holy Spirit, man, is God's river, his flow. It comes from him to us, and whatever in our life is not alive. And maybe the better way to ask it is this. Can you identify things in your life that are not producing, things that are decaying, things that are just not, they're just not alive, and you're just like, God, help me with this. God, wait, I've been talking about the, the, the idea of passion. When your passion goes, when you lose that zest and that, that fire. The Holy Spirit is the answer for that thing. It is not zest or soap or toothpaste. It's you need the Holy Spirit flowing in you to give you life again. And so it's a great picture of that. And I got stuck on number one and I don't want to, but this tree of life, man, this thing that God, I, I, I just think it's so interesting that in the garden, he creates all the trees that the man and woman can eat from. And in the center of the garden are two trees, the tree of life, the knowledge of good and evil. And of all the millions of trees that are there, the only one, the only one, not species, not part of the garden, the only tree that we can't eat from is the knowledge of good and evil because he's so clear to us. If you eat from it, you shall surely. And the very thing that the man and woman do is wrong. Why don't they go to the tree of life? Because we don't automatically choose life. We will choose the thing that we think will bring us life, but actually brings us death. And the worst part about it is, when you eat of that fruit, it doesn't kill you instantly. It goes into your life. It begins the decay process. And after a, 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 a series of events, you'll ask yourself, what's wrong with me? And you'll point to something going on right then and there, but you missed it. It's whenever you took that thing into yourself that you have to go back and get rid of it. Am I making any sense at all? Sorry. Um, <clears throat> the second one's the curse. So the curse, just simply um, in verse three, it says this. No longer <clears throat> will there be a what? Curse. Upon anything for the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there and his servants will worship him. All right, so what does this mean real quickly? When, when man and woman went their own way, when the enemy was able to tempt the woman, she ate of the fruit, and then she turned and gave some to her husband, both of them knowing that they should not do this, that God said explicitly, don't do this because the day you do it, you shall surely die. They did it, and there was a resulting uh, incident that happened on the earth. So we can read about it right here, Genesis 3, uh, these three verses. God speaking to the man said, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, look at this, the ground is what? Because of you, 
all your life. You will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grains. By the sweat of your brow will you have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. And then this little thing that's used at a funeral, uh, for you were made from dust and to dust you will return. Dust you are, dust you will return. All right, here, here's the thought on that, is that God had created, apparently from the wording, God had created the earth Nature, man, all he created, all of creation, God created them to work together in an effortless unity. That everything man put his hand to produced fruitfulness without having to sweat to do it. Let me just ask those of you who have worked for a long time, how wonderful would it be that everything you put your hand to without having to, to sweat that hard produced your, rela- your marriage? That was a great place to like, you know. <laughs> So how good would it be that if you got married, it was just easy? Yes. So are you a free chicken? <laughs> Come on. doesn't mean your wife's difficult. You're the one who's... Uh, why are relationships difficult with each other? Why are they not just easy? Do you ever think about that? Well, because her personality, Pastor, that's in a nutshell. Uh, it... it why, why do we deal with the constant, uh, the rat race of trying to get over? The, why are finances? A, and, and then listen to this. If you beat it in one place, like you can overcome the finances, then it goes wrong in your health. Yeah. Or you get it together in your health and in your finances, but then your marriage goes backwards. Yeah. Yes. Am I talking to anybody? Yes. So, and we face this and then we're like, God, why did you do this? God's like, not me. (laughs) So this curse, man, I'm joking about it a little bit, but we've never seen the earth without it. And God's intention is to restore everything to this order eventually. Okay, so let's, let's, uh, this is Paul teaching this same thought. Uh, He's teaching the church at Rome, and he said he's talking about creation. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse, but with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up until this present moment that I'm writing this. And we believers also groan even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste or a deposit of God's future glory. For we long for our own bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. So Paul is describing what I just told you happened. This curse that has come upon the earth, all of creation has been longing to be released. The reason that you know it could be better than it is right now is because inside of you is this longing to be released. You try so hard, you work so diligent, and yet it seems futile so many times, doesn't it? And how many people in that futility give up and quit because they assume, they judge God, God's not doing this for me. Part of it is just we live on an earth where this is going to be what we trudge through. You don't give up. And God, here's what it says, that the Holy Spirit has been given to you as a deposit of what it's going to be like. The reason you want the Holy Spirit in your life is because you can experience in a limited way what it's going to look like at that day and that time. You don't have to just live with decay. Dude, you can have life when everybody else is decaying. And if you said woo, you get it. <clears throat> the final enemy of the curse, though, according to what Paul said, is death and decay. So 1 Corinthians 15, 26, this is Paul again. The very last enemy to be destroyed is what? His death. So this is not funny, and I won't joke about this in any way. The worst part about the curse is that we deal with death. God's intention on this earth was that you would never deal with death because he knew the pain of death. 
God created it where you could live. And in fact, if you know anything about the Bible, this is what it says in Genesis, that when the man and woman ate of the knowledge of good and evil and they fell, that God pushed them out of the Garden of Eden, not because he was angry with them, but he said this, we must push them out lest they reach forth their hand, take of the tree of life, and live forever in this condition of the curse. So it was God's mercy on you that kept you from staying in that state of decay forever, man. You imagine. And so the, the very thought here is that the last enemy, and apparently, can I just say something about death? Apparently, death is some kind of a spirit because the Bible says uh, in Revelation that Jesus ultimately on that day takes death and decay and throws it into the lake of fire. He'll deal with it once and for all, and you'll never deal with death again. So while death is a reality that happens, it, in some way, it's a spiritual issue too. It's a spiritual issue too. Um, I, I'm just, I gotta go. The third one's the face. So the river, the curse, the face. Uh, Revelations 22, 4 and 5. Let me just read this to you. Uh, and they will see his what? Face. Him is Jesus. And his name, Jesus' name, will be written on their foreheads. And there will be no night, no need for lamps or for the sun. It doesn't say there won't be a sun. Just that the need for it is not going to be the same as it is today. For the Lord God will shine on them and they will reign forever and ever. The only thing in scripture I can even point to you that gives us a picture of this. Uh, when Jesus is walking with the disciples, uh, in the Bible, the story of the transfiguration happens. Those, can you remember the transfiguration? Jesus comes to Mount Tabor. He's got the disciples with him. Crowds are following him. They get to the bottom of the, of the mountain. They call it a mountain. It's a hill. They get to the bottom of it and Jesus takes a couple of his disciples and takes them up to the top, higher. And we get to the top, man, the Bible says that the glory of God descended on the top of this mountain, and it was like a, a cloud that was on the top of the mountain. And the disciples in Jesus, they see Moses. Yeah. And they see Elijah. And they're having a conversation. This is when Peter goes, hey, do you want us to build uh, little shelters for everybody to sleep in? He's always saying something ridiculous. <laughs> Doesn't know how to respond, like, uh... That's Elijah. I wonder if he needs a place to sleep. Um, so Jesus probably, it, he doesn't even, he just kind of probably like, stay over there. And, and so then it says this about Jesus, that Jesus began to shine so brightly, it looked like the noonday sun and people couldn't look directly at him because he was reflecting the glory of God's presence being so close. And do you, you want to know what your job really is in this earth? It's to reflect the image of God back to the earth. The proof when people say, is God alive? They should be able to look at you and go, look at what God's done for that person right there. So just listen real quickly. So what's being described here and why there's not a need for the sun, God's presence is going to be so close. We're going to live in that presence and we will reflect the presence of God, which is brighter than the sun. So when you have two lights and one is stronger than the other, it's not that this one doesn't exist. You just can't see this one because this one outshines it. And that's what this is right here, man. It's the face of God. The result of his presence, listen, is that there will never be darkness in the idea that, that the enemy has a place to operate. There will be no place for the enemy in the presence of God. You'll never deal with those things again. Now, I think this is, just real quick, I want to do this because I, um, I just think this is, this is like, I want you to get this, man. Um, when, when the man and the woman fell, this curse comes upon the earth, but I don't think that's the worst thing that resulted from the fall of man. I think the worst thing that resulted was that God's habit, listen to what I'm saying, his habit was that in the afternoon, God would come to the earth and he would walk with the man, W-A-L-K. And it means just simply to hang out. In modern vernacular would be, God came to the earth to hang out with the man. Yeah. Just to, have you ever just said, God, I wish you would just show up. I wish, I, I wish you'd talk to me. I wish I could experience you. For those of you who love Jesus, that has to be one of the calls of your heart. Yeah. So Adam had this, Eve had this. And the worst thing that happens is when their eyes are opened, 
they become fearful of God, not intimate with God. Listen, how do we know? God comes to the earth and he calls out, Adam, where are you? Do you really think God didn't know? God knew exactly. He's asking the question to get Adam to realize something dramatic has changed. The only reason God is even saying, where are you? Here's what would happen. God would come to the earth and Adam would come from wherever he was to meet God. And on this day, after the fall, he hides from God. So God says, Adam, where are you? Adam comes out and he says, uh, I was hiding because I, hid, I, I heard you and I was afraid, so I hid from your presence. And from that time forward, all creation runs from God instead of to God. And so we act like, oh, no, that's not, that's not us. We use religion to be a thing that allows us to be in the, around God without having to go face to face. Because there's just this thing in us that instead of seeing him as our father, we can, we're always worried about what he's going to do when he knows. And he knows and loves you anyway. And so this great point here is that one of the things that will be restored is that the, the word face means to be intimate with God, to be face to face with him. And so what will be restored is that we will want to be in God's presence all the time. It will not be something that we experience from time to time, place to place, but we live our lives sort of like, you know, my church life is over here, but my other life is over here. It will be one continuous thing to be in the presence of God. My, that makes sense? Okay, I, yeah. Okay, the conclusion, sorry, I, uh, I nerd out on that. So, so the conclusion is this right here. The spirit and the bride, so the spirit is the Holy Spirit inside of us, the witness. The bride is his body. So the spirit and the bride say to Jesus, come on. And let anyone who hears this and gets it say, come on. And let anyone who is thirsty and wants to drink of that living water, come on. Let anyone who, who is desiring to drink freely from the waters of life, come on. Amen. It's an invitation. And it's not only an invitation, it's a prayer that we're supposed to be praying, Jesus, come on. And if you're not looking forward or ever thinking about the return of Jesus, the enemy has killed something inside of you that needs to be brought back to life. There's just no other way to say that. Something inside of you should be excited at Jesus' return. And if you're nervous about that or you never think about that, I'm telling you, man, as his bride, as a believer, we're supposed to be excited at the idea of God restoring everything back to its original order. We're supposed to be excited about that. And in fact, the Bible says that there's a blessing for those who are waiting, a crown for those who are waiting and looking forward to his return. All right, um, here's what we're doing to close this. Grab the little communion element that's on your chair right there or the floor. And then do me a favor, if you will. There's two parts to it. The top one is just clear cellophane. If you'd pull that back and grab the wafer, don't eat it, just hold on to it. And then the second one is that purple foil. If you'd pull that back, so that you can get to the juice. And again, just hold it and we'll do this together as a family. Okay, so hopefully I can try to connect and, and, and tie this in a bow real quickly. Okay, so on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he's celebrating the Passover. And the Passover has four cups of wine. The third cup is called the cup of redemption so that when Jesus, when we pick up the story where Jesus takes the cup and he says, this is now the new covenant, which is in my blood, he's actually at the third cup during supper, which is the cup of redemption because it represents Jesus is our redemption from sin. It's, it's all, there's so much symmetry. And so he says, this, this is recorded in one of the gospels. Listen to this. Jesus himself says this, from this day forward, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until I do it in my father's house with you. So Jesus waits to do this again with us on that day when he returns. It's called the marriage supper of the lamb. We're the bride, he's the groom. But he tells us, in the meantime, I want you to do this without me 
to remind yourselves of who I am and what I've promised you. So he promised you life. Not just any life, but abundant life, John 10.10. 10. He promised you that wherever the river flows, everything lives. If you were to literally think that God wants to do that in your life, could this represent a moment that you're taking into you God's life? And could we believe that if there's something in your life that's not living, that Jesus is the answer to those things? That his spirit, man, is healing. His spirit is restoration. His spirit is joy. His spirit, it, it is hope. And if that's anywhere near you today and you're like, man, I need God to bring life to me again. I need God to revive my spirit, revive my relationship, revive my children. Folks, don't sit idly by just letting life pass you by. Man, stand up and grab on to the things that Jesus has done for us. and Say that belongs to me and I will believe that and I will stand on that. And then we seal it when we do this right here. So Father, when Jesus gave us the bread, he said, this is my body which is broken for you so that you don't have to be broken. In the broken body of Jesus is healing. In his voluntary sacrifice is your life. He took your death so you could have his life. He took your punishment so you could have his blessing. Don't let the enemy lie to you and deceive you and tell you, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you've got a different reality that you're going to live. Stop that. Stand on what Jesus said right now. I did this for you. So remind yourself of what I've done when you take this into yourself. So Jesus, thank you for giving yourself for us. God, we receive your sacrifice as our gift so that we can have life right now. And God, we take that life into ourselves. Wherever the river flows, everything lives. God, bring life to us. Let's eat together. The Bible says in the same manner he took the cup, he lifted it to the Father, and he said, this is now the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Blood covenants are eternal covenants. Jesus said that this covenant is a better covenant than the one that came through Moses because it's based on better promises. He's the promise. He's the promised one. And as you drink this, take into yourself the promise of God that wherever the river flows, everything lives. Let's drink. Mm. Father, just seal that inside of us right now. Lord, even if we're like, I don't know that I feel any different than I did before you started. God, it's not our feelings that we go by, it's faith that we go by. So remind us, God, that we can believe in your promises. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.